Uh, we have a special guest today. He's presenting, calling in from San Francisco. But before I give the floor to him, I just want to share a bit about Product Management Festival, our initiatives, um, how you can benefit from them, what else we do. And as soon as I'm done, we're gonna get to the main presentation of today. So um, for those of you who do not know, Product Management Festival is a conference. We have a conference in Zurich happening on the 9th, 10th of November. We're waiting for uh, around 1,000 um 200 product managers this year so if you have a chance to join us it's gonna be a super exciting experience uh we also do a conference in singapore probably 2023 will be our next edition and uh apart from our events big events we also have smaller events throughout the, the world um in person finally. So actually in July, we're gonna start to do again in-person events. Uh, one of the first ones will be in uh, Zurich, Switzerland, uh, PM Night. You find the details on our web website, you can sign up. And um, then there's an upcoming one in Milano, uh, New York. And if you want to run as well one in your community, just reach out. Next month, we're gonna publish a new edition of the Trends and Benchmarks report. This uh, is a very well appreciated um, report with, uh, where um, we basically present the results of our survey, where we survey over 2000 product managers. So you can find out information regarding what's the average salary of a PM uh, in your country um, for your position. So maybe it's helpful when you're looking for a new job or asking for a raise. Uh, you can find out information about how teams are structured, uh, what's the relation, the ratio between developers, PMs, UX designers in typical PM teams and many, many other things. The report we provide always for free what we want in exchange is that you fill out the survey when you send it out and also share with other members of the community the existence of this report. Oh, in September 12, 16, we also have a product management executive program we run with the business school in SAD, one of the leading schools uh, in MBAs. It's one week uh, dedicated to sharpen your product leadership skills. So if you're an aspiring uh, product leader looking for a CPO position, a position in as a VP of product or have just joined one, or one role and are a bit challenged, um, this is for sure for you. If you want to know more details, we have uh, an advisor who can discuss with you and figure out if this is the right type of education um, you can pursue further. And uh, for November, for our big event, we already are announcing speakers. So these are some of, just some of the over 50 speakers who are gonna take the stage. Uh, as always, we try to cover as many industries as possible and as many geographical representations as possible. So if you're free, join the experience. It's not just a conference, it's really a great community feeling. Um, and again, if you want to know more, just join us. With that being said, I would like to thank you today to Amplitude, who basically made possible this event, and uh, welcome Ibrahim. Um, he's going to speak today about optimizing customer experience through product analytics by also the using Amplitude. and. <laughs> as soon as he uh, starts presenting, if you have any questions, you can just type them in the chat and we will take them at the end and uh, try the, the best way possible to support you with any challenges in product analytics you may have. Ibrahim, thank you very much for being with us today. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh to the product management festival and thank you to everybody here in attendance um i will start presenting um and as our host just mentioned uh if at any point you have questions feel free to uh throw them in the chat and we will uh get to them before the top of the hour 
Cool. So I'm uh, I'm excited to be talking to you all today about optimizing the customer experience um, through product analytics, of which Amplitude um, is the market leader in the product analytics category. Um, and I want to sort of go through uh, what the customer experience means, why it's important to optimize it, and how a product analytics tool can actually support you in doing that. Uh, but first, I just wanted to give a little bit of a quick background about me. Um, so I have uh, a decade plus in product development roles. Um, my first uh, real product role was at Amazon, where I was <coughs> a PM on the Kindle team. Um, so I worked on uh, several generations of devices, uh, content, software, on-device software, server-side software, um, a variety of initiatives. I was the PM of the first international device, uh, the first uh, localized device, and the first Kindle tablet. Um, so spent a lot of time thinking about end user experiences, content, uh, reading, et cetera. Um, from there, I worked on the platform products at Twitter. So focused a lot on performance, reliability, scale, costs, um, things about running the service and the business. Um, after that, I was uh, the head of the developer and workflow products businesses at Box. Um, so worked a lot in enterprise software, B2B, um, understanding sort of knowledge worker concerns, as well as enterprise buyer concerns. And then I'm currently the head of the core product, the analytics product at Amplitude. I've been here um, a year and a half um, and uh, happy to answer any questions at the end about how Amplitude can help in your um, analytics and customer experience optimization journey. So that's a little bit about me. But let's actually talk a little bit about how um, all of our lives, including my life, uh, has changed over the last decade in terms of how we operate. Um, so just to give you a flavor, and you know, you you may have your own apps <coughs> and products that you're using, but just to give you an example of my day, um, you know, day starts in the morning. You might be using a Peloton or some connected device uh, to do a workout, right, uh, with a personalized workout routine. Um, you might have your groceries delivered through Instacart or some other service right to your door. Um, you go into work and you might be using Atlassian products to actually collaborate with your uh, product engineering design research QA team. Um, at lunchtime, you might want to donate to charity and use GoFundMe, right? Um, go back to work and you're using HubSpot. You're actually using some new features. <clears throat> uh, order something through the Walmart mobile app. Uh, order a meal through the Burger King app, uh, pay your friends and split the cost of dinner through PayPal, watch uh, optimized content selection through NBC in the evening, maybe do a little bit of meditation in the Calm app, and then the cycle repeats. And the, the thing I'm trying to highlight here um, is not these specific products, but how much of each of our daily routines is now um, connected to other digital products through digital touch points, right? Almost there is not an hour in the day where you're not interacting with some end user uh, B2B or B2C application or digital touch point. Um, and that's not um, abnormal, that's just the new reality. And if you think about this in the context of history, um, you know, till the, about the year 2020, there were uh, half billion digital products. And then in the last just two to three years, that same number of digital products has come out, right? Um, and so we've doubled the number of digital products in the world just in the last couple of years. So it's been exponential growth um, for just the last two or three years. And the reason that matters, the reason that matters to all of you as product managers and product management leaders in charge of product strategy and product outcomes at your respective companies is it means a bunch of different things. It means there is increased competition for your user's wallet and attention. Um, there is a lot more choices for people to solve their problems. Um, you're tackling more and more complex workflows um, and user behavior. And finally, um, time to market and speed of, of solving problems actually really matters because of how much choice and competition there is in the market. Um, so this is some of the reasons why uh, not only have digital products proliferated, but it's very, very important to make sure you have a digital product where you nail the customer experience. So I'm going to throw out maybe a controversial statement, which is if you think about any product that didn't work, that quote unquote failed, that didn't sort of capture the market or user attention, um, that product is probably also connected to a customer experience failure. So let's talk a little bit about the actual difference between a product and the customer experience. 
Let's actually walk through two different companies and two different customer experiences, company A and company B. For company A, um, they tailor the experience to what the channel offers. What I mean by that is when their users are on web, they see an experience that is tied to web. Um, when their users are on mobile, they might see sort of the capabilities that are designed around iOS, Android, or any other mobile platform. Um, they tend to have one experience that they're trying to fit into each of these different modalities. They think of every customer interaction as a static point in time interaction. So if their user interacts with them on desktop web, that's one interaction. If they interact with them on mobile web, that's a different interaction. And those are disconnected siloed interactions. Um, company A thinks about acquiring users as the end goal. Um, just, you know, how much traffic am I getting? How many of those people are signing up and converting? And then customer value, like actually solving a problem or making sure that the customer is seeing value after they subscribe or sign up is secondary. So that's, that's company A. Um, if you contrast that with company B, rather than letting the channel or the modality dictate the experience, they actually try to unify the experience across the channels. What I mean by that is they understand that sometimes people will start on web and switch to mobile or vice versa. And they've put a lot of thought into what parts of the experience are optimized in web versus mobile and when and how you want people to switch, right? I mean, it doesn't just have to be web and mobile. It could be IoT. It could be other kinds of digital touch points like kiosks or vending machines, et cetera. Um, company B actually tries to personalize the user experience. They try to look at the context where the user is, what we know about the user, whether they're new, whether they've been dormant, whether they're uh, an active user, and actually try to tailor the experience based on their preferences and defaults. Um, rather than treating each interaction with the customer as a static point in time interaction, they actually try to think of once this interaction is complete, where do I want to take the user in their journey? And what is the right channel or platform to do that? So you might be ordering a delivery meal on the website, but they know the next step should be on the mobile app, you get a notification when your driver's on the way, right? Things like that. Um, they understand that you not only need to acquire users, but actually successfully activate and onboard them and get them to engage. That is the actual end goal. And what they try to do is every time a user interacts with their product, they want to make sure the value of using that product versus all the other alternative products we talked about is reinforced. So rather than having value conversations occasionally, every interaction is a point of value reinforcement. And obviously, you want to be like company B. As you can see, their customer experience is just going to be far superior, far more personalized, far more delightful to the end user, which in turn affects the buyer as well, whether that's the end user or some other person. And I want to just give you an example of how complex this can get, um, just using some other apps uh, that are Amplitude customers. So you might be PayPal, and you can think of this as a full customer journey. So all the way from like looking at an ad to signing up to viewing a page um, to actually interacting with content. Uh, to actually switching between devices, to actually you know thinking through whether people are first-time users or uh, nth-time users, whether they're using your primary product or your second product. But let's talk through a couple of these examples. Um, if I'm PayPal and people look at a mobile ad before they sign up for PayPal, you can ask questions like, why have mobile users retained higher than on web? What's going on with that particular audience? or that channel that is leading to better long-term retention. If I'm Autodesk, I can try to figure out what's happening in my navigation flow where some people successfully view the page and sign up and others don't. Where do they actually fall out of that step-by-step -step conversion funnel? Um, if I'm IBM, oops, sorry. If I'm IBM, uh, I can try to figure out what is the right mix of products to position to my customers to optimize their lifetime value? I might be HBO and I can try to figure out which shows are watched in linear fashion, which shows are binge watched, uh, which shows are watched by people who watch certain other shows. So I can recommend the next show I want them to subscribe to. I might be Instacart and I can try to figure out how to actually optimize mobile orders, repeat orders, how to get wishlist items ordered and added on to carts as well. I might be trying to optimize the size of an order or number of orders or increasing the number of users with multiple orders or at least one order. Um, I might be New Relic, which is trying to figure out 
how to actually steer new users from becoming product users by using more than one product. So these are just some of the examples of the types of questions that customers ask to try to optimize the CX. Uh, and for each of you, I'm, this is a great opportunity to think about some questions you might wanna ask later. What is your particular customer journey uh, where you're trying to optimize and improve the customer experience? So I wanna share this quote, and, and I hope it's, it's coming across sort of the difference between what we've traditionally referred to as product and the full customer experience. And so I'll just read this quote, which is there's a trend going on, especially in SaaS products, where the product is no longer just the software. The SaaS product actually consists of the software, the data in and data out, the human inputs, the APIs, the integrations. And with this evolving definition of product, we actually need PMs to see and understand this, that the entire digital customer journey is the product from the customer's point of view. And that should change how you sort of approach what you're building and what you're optimizing. So I wanna walk through a very, very uh, simple uh, loop. Every product will have this, which is um, there's some sort of buildup that happens with your customer or your user on their journey. And then you have this first moment where they understand, where they really discover and are sort of um, uh, absorb the value of your product. And once you reach that first moment, you want to sort of keep them going and keep giving them a payoff for investing with you until you get to the next moment. This is sort of the very standard, uh, any user journey can be modeled like this. And if you think about it uh, from a customer journey perspective, the, the first hurdle you're usually trying to cross is awareness. Does my customer actually know that I am a viable solution to their product, uh, to their problem? If yes, they might purchase. And then you wanna actually be reinforcing value to the point where they become an advocate for your product and actually renew, right? And this applies to BDC products where your customer might be your buyer where your user might be your buyer. It also applies to B2B and enterprise products where your user may actually be advocating to a buyer uh, at an enterprise level to, to spend money on your product. But what does that actually look like in practice? When you think about awareness and raising awareness, <clears throat> you might be doing some or all of these things, running email campaigns, um, uh, trying to optimize organic search online, uh, having people write and share product reviews, having people internally and externally from your company who are brand evangelists. Uh, and then finally, some, some manner of online advertising to um, generate demand and leads. On the advocacy side, um, you can think about support forums as a way to support your products, loyalty programs that reinforce user behavior, conferences around your product if it's sort of a new way of working or operating. Uh, an entire partner ecosystem can form around certain products. And obviously, customer testimonials are a way for your biggest champions and fans to express their loyalty. But what's interesting about all of these ways that you can generate awareness and advocacy is how much product is at the center of it. And one of the trends that we're seeing is product is actually the center of the core customer journey. So even before people have bought, even while they're trialing or doing a proof of concept, even when they're in the early days of um, trying to understand how to use your product, the product is at the heart of all of those experiences in that customer journey. So let's, let's switch gears and talk about, let's say somebody is a customer already and now they're starting to become a user. They're starting to onboard and activate in your product. What you'll see is a couple of different loops. One is um, they're going to attempt to onboard. And you know onboarding can be a minute, a day, a week, a month, uh, a quarter. Um, you know, the different products have different onboarding cycles. Um, and it's not a one and done thing. It, it goes through phases with different users and different teams and departments. But once you're onboarded, you've kind of reached an activation phase. And then you have people using your product. And your goal is, as they're using, they start using it in a more sophisticated way. And the reason you want that is they're going to be stickier if they do that. And stickiness means uh, more likely to advocate, less likely to churn, and all sorts of other good things. So what does that actually look like from a user journey perspective? On the activation side, you might actually be focused on how to get people to convert and sign up. You have to think through the first time user experience. You wanna actually steer the onboarding to that aha moment, which might be different for different types of users. Um, you actually wanna shorten 
how long it takes to get to that aha moment and realize value. And you want to take people who might be at a very novice level where they're barely using or not using the product to the point where they're a professional level and actually have formed a habit loop around using the product. That's the activation side. And then on the sophistication side, you want to make sure that you don't overwhelm your users with all of the capabilities that you have out of the box. You want to do what we call progressive disclosure, which is actually steer them towards more complex and advanced capabilities as they are ready to see them. Um, you want to get people doing high value use cases. I know for all of you working on products yourselves, you can always categorize and say, hey, look, users who do um, ABC are, are active users of our product, but users who do XYZ, they are much less likely to churn, right? They're more likely to retain. And so we all know what our high value use cases are, and we want to steer people towards that. You also want to steer people towards premium features, right? Because they are um, higher margins, more profitability, and better value for the user. Um, you want to actually make sure the value that people are getting from your product is shared with other people who need to form a perception about your product or are part of the workflow. And you wanna steer people from basic to advanced usage. And the thing about the user journey, um, obviously product is at the center of the user journey, but this is where product analytics comes in. Product analytics is actually the capability that helps you unlock the key loops, the key funnels, the key behaviors in your user journey. That's why product analytics matters as you're trying to understand and optimize your customer experience and your core user journey. And so what does it actually mean to be using product analytics? These are some of the things you can do with product analytics. You can figure out the critical path or paths in your product. Um, we all know this, but it, it doesn't hurt to be reminded. Most of users of your product, 80% of them will use 20% of the functionality. Knowing what that 20% of functionality is and really optimizing that path for whatever the outcome is, is critical. Um, understanding who is successfully going through a journey or a workflow or not and why is critical, right? Uh, understanding the funnel, the drop-off points, user behavior, what leads to completion, what doesn't, um, is a critical part of it. Most metrics that uh, any of us own are tied to successful journey completion. You might be an e-commerce site with an order. You might be an uh, online subscription platform with subscribe as the end action. But whatever the end outcome is that you're driving, you want people to actually get there versus drop off You know, at step minus one, minus two. Um, there is a lot of focus in, in product teams about getting users who are inactive activated and getting users who are activated uh, to actually doing very advanced usage, right? And forming buckets of those users, cohort segments, analyzing behavior at a cohort level is critical in many, many products, right? You can't drive conclusions based on one user behavior, but if you can say users on mobile tend to do this or users on desktop tend to do that or users who successfully converted have these characteristics in common, you can definitely do a lot with that information and product analytics can help you understand those behaviors. Um, you can actually start to understand your value drivers. What are the reasons people buy? What are the reasons people activate? What are the reasons people convert? And what are reasons that don't matter so that we can divest or spend less time on those. Um, all of us as product people have uh, not enough resources, not enough engineering time and too many ideas. And so it really is important to know which of your bets really matter and which of them are not a good use of time. And so actually avoiding low leverage bets is another advantage of product analytics. It makes sure you're spending energy on the highest ROI bets. So that's just a flavor of some of the things you can do with product analytics. Um, so let's go back to our example of two companies. And, uh, you know, they, although they approach the world in different ways, let's see how they kind of operate if one of them has product analytics company B and one of them does not. So for company A, what ends up happening is um, they may not have a product analytics solution in place, or they may not have adopted it properly, or the barrier might be too high, or it might be dependent on a centralized analytics or data science team. And the net result of that is sporadic usage of analysis, right? Sometimes you're using data to make decisions, but it's not part of the cultural norm. Contrast that with company B, where every product team, whether it's the product manager, the researcher, designer, engineer, tech lead, is able to go and ask and get answers to questions. They're able to generate hypotheses on their own versus waiting on a centralized team. 
for company A, because they're using and uh, they're sporadically using data to make decisions, they have an incomplete view of the customer. And as we talked about earlier, the customer journey is pretty broad. It's all touch points. It's everything from discovery to engagement. And so if you have blind spots in any parts of that journey, you're not going to have a 360 view. If you think about company B with product analytics instrumented correctly, they see a full view all the way from acquisition to lifetime value, right? And having that clear view tells you where the highest leverage points might be. For some companies, it might be on the acquisition side. For some companies, it might be on the activation side. And for some companies, it might be on the engagement side. <laughs> if you think about company A, and they're either not regularly using analytics and data to make decisions uh, and relying on centralized teams and have an incomplete view, there's going to be a significant lag between insights and action. Um, sometimes actions are not based on insights. Sometimes there's insights that don't get actioned on, uh, but that lag starts to add up over time versus with company B, it starts to become a muscle that different product teams are building, right? Where they're able to get their own insights and take action around those insights and then repeat the process. And if you um, extrapolate that out over a quarter, a year, uh, a couple of years, one company that's sort of been uh, sporadically trying things and another company that is just in a habit of trying good ideas, validating them or putting them aside, um, it's just going to compound over time, right? Because company A will waste cycles on dead end bets. Company B will actually um, it's like an optimization algorithm. We'll focus on high leverage bets. And over the course of time, company B is much more likely to find a moonshot or a 10x bet than company A. Company B is just going to end up doing more quality bets over the long run. And what that means in the end is company A is going to have a mixed track record of decisions. Um, as a company, as a product team, as a, as a culture, it's going to say, hey, look, they had they did some good things, but they had a lot of things that didn't make any sense or didn't pay off. And company B, not everything is going to work out perfectly, but they're going to have a stronger track record of quality decisions, right? And that matters to the company. It matters to the business. It matters to the end users and the customer. And it actually matters for your ability to attract and retain talent as well, right? Everybody wants to work at a company that has operationalized good product thinking and decision making, which product analytics lets you do. So let's switch gears in a little bit and talk about how Amplitude actually enables a company that wants to use product analytics to optimize the customer experience and be more data driven. And the way Amplitude actually does this is a three part loop. One is just visibility, seeing and understanding customer behavior and contrast that with either not having that visibility or having that visibility at a very superficial level, Amplitude will actually help you understand customer behavior, right? It will help you understand why things are happening or not happening. And that leads us to the next part of the loop. It'll actually help you predict, put percentages and say, hey, look, I want to drive people to doing ABC because if they do ABC, it leads to good top level outcomes that I care about, activation, engagement, retention. Um, and finally, if you can understand why users do or don't do certain things, and you can predict which actions will lead to the outcomes you want, you can actually adapt the experience to maximize impact all the way from overall changes for your entire user base to things that are very curated and personalized for any one specific customer, right? You can apply personalization at very at different levels of altitude. And that's what a product analytic solution and specifically Amplitude help you do. So I just want to compare and contrast like what that actually looks like, right? If you think about company A, they have customer data, they have a product experience, there's a data repository, you end up having to write custom SQL and wait for weeks on a centralized analyst or data science team to answer a question, right? Versus with the amplitude, the data instrumentation is in place, the data is streamed in, it's real time, people can ask and answer questions on their own, what we call self-service. And then they can actually try those ideas and see, did my idea pay off? Looking at that baseline metric ahead. And you know the comparison, this is not an exaggeration, can be three weeks versus 30 seconds, right? And just multiply that day after day, week after week, month after month, quarter after quarter, year after year. Obviously, with a solution like Amplitude in place, your velocity, your decision quality and your decision velocity really exponentially compounds over time. And so uh, the, the last thing I want to highlight is the degree to which um, Amplitude is not just for product teams, but it is for product teams and everybody they collaborate with, engineering, design, marketing, data science executives, 
it's no code, it's no SQL, it's instant answers. And it allows for this collaboration because product development is a team sport, right? We all know that you, the product team doesn't in, independently come up with ideas and try them. You need them designed. You need engineering to buy in and scope them. You need marketing to position them and sell them. You need data science to validate your hypotheses. You need executives to buy in and staff it and fund it. And so that type of cross-team collaboration is critical to actually becoming uh, a data-driven uh, customer experience optimizing team. And so some of the questions um, that you can start to answer, uh, ask and answer, I've highlighted here, but you can think about the sophistication uh, of a product team. You know, there's a baseline level where you're just sort of measuring your KPIs, like how many customers do this or that, right? Um, to actually understanding changes, like is my new feature being adopted and why? to identifying the drivers, which features actually lead to the outcomes I want, to actually predicting outcomes, right? If I do X, what are the expected lift or incremental value of that? And then finally, adapting and personalizing the experience to drive the outcomes based on the drivers, based on understanding the behavior that connect to the KPIs. Um, and so there are obviously different levels of maturity that different teams have with adopting product analytic solution, but this is sort of the five-tier uh, model that we've um, come across. And, and finally, I just want to give one last visual representation of company A versus company B. If you go back to company A, um, you know, they keep adding features. Some of them work, some of them don't. They don't really know why. Um, there might be some initial spikes, but then they tend not to last and then growth flattens. And this becomes sort of a vicious cycle and a death cycle for many products that didn't work out, right? We started this discussion with, let's talk about what's common with products that don't work out. They end up in this death cycle. But if you think about a team that is using product analytics, um, they are actually able to generate quality hypotheses. They are able to prioritize work that's based on grounded data decision-making. They actually iterate on those through experiments. And then they're actually able to close the loop and analyze and see, did this specific idea have the expected lift better or worse? And repeat, 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 and it compounds over time. Um, so that's a little bit about how product analytics and specifically Amplitude can help you optimize the customer journey. Um, but with that, I, I want to sort of pause on my prepared presentation and maybe turn it over to the audience uh, for questions. Thank you so much, Ibrahim. That was super insightful. Um, everyone here, if you have questions for me, Ibrahim, please type them in the chat. Um, I I had one regarding a bit like uh, company A com com versus company B, and you focus on the customer experience. Um, we have this at PMF, so let's say for a very long historical time, we focused our communication more on our um, calendar uh, events, let's say. So we really uh, didn't think at all about the customer journey. And we realized as well since a while that um not everybody is at the same time not everybody at the same place not everybody understands not uh, the same thing not everybody has seen what uh, product management festival does uh, maybe some people have already been at the event and they we can communicate with them differently but the challenge comes here to for us at least uh, in the sense of until which uh, depth should we focus on personalizing this customer experience, journey experience? Because we have, let's say, is there a minimum segment size which uh, you should have? Because I think you can go so granular into creating 50 cases for uh, customer, 50 actions, 50 triggers. So what would be a, a good indicator we can look at, for example, to decide, okay, we should personalize in this case and maybe refrain in this case. Yeah, I would say, um, you know, I always try to bring it back to prioritization. So obviously, yes, there's many, many different directions and depths you can go with personalization, but I would start with identify your core journey, right? Identify what is the thing that 80% of your customers do. And that in itself is a question a lot of companies don't have an answer to is what is the most common flow? Once you have that flow, then you should ask the question of does personalization actually lead to better conversion or better outcomes? Because 
obviously like personalization is a good tactic, but it's one tactic, right? Automation is another tactic. Uh, reducing steps is another tactic. There's a lot of different ways to complete the user journey and get people to do what you want them to do. Uh, reminders might be another tactic. So I wouldn't default to personalization, is it? I would think about that core workflow and say, what do we think and why do we think that something might improve this, right? So to, to bring it back to personalization, you might look at that journey and then try to split and say, let's look at people who completed the journey and let's look at people who almost completed the journey. And you might see that personalization is the difference. You might see that something else was the difference, right? Um, notifications or a particular channel or a particular origin point. And so once you've identified that origin point of where leverage can come from, I would go after that. And I'd, I'd sort of approach that iteratively, right? So if you think personalization is a key, try one thing. If it pays off, then go deeper. And then the minute you know things not working or you've sort of optimized it to how far it's going to get, then I would switch tracks, right? And obviously we're talking about it in a very binary way, but um, you definitely sort of as a product team have to think about it's not I'm doing all this and none of that, but it's like, how much do I want to do this versus that? And it could be 50-50, it could be 80-20, it could be 100-0. That's also a point of discussion. And that comes down to how much conviction you have in the drivers that you've learned about, right? Thank you so much, Ibrahim. That helps a lot. Uh, we're going to start on it. <laughs> um, cool, we have one question from Cheyenne. Uh, Shane, would you like to ask your question to Ibrahim live so we can hear your voice? <clears throat> hi. Yeah, sorry. Hi. How are you doing? Good. You guys hear me? Um, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, Ibrahim. Thank you. This is this has really been a, a great presentation on on the kind of insights and what amplitude offers. I was just kind of curious from my perspective on. Um, with your experience, like what's your, the kind of best approach with the customer experience and the user experience if if a company that you're working for has never really done this? Um, you know, you have to kind of get buy-in from, you know, execs and uh, different stakeholders and teams on how, you know, how this is actually going to help shape um, the kind yeah. of decision. So uh, great question, first of all, Shane. Um, I would say a couple of things. One is if... Um, if a company doesn't have the muscle already, you know, it's kind of like going to the gym. You don't go from, I've never lifted weights to now all of a sudden I'm trying to do powerlifting on day one. So you almost yeah. have to like ease people into it. So I would say the first thing to do is um, just show that there is a connection between a better customer experience, a better user experience and the things you care about. Um, not to oversimplify, but most companies tend to care about one of three things and, and usually all three things. Um, Am I growing? How much am I growing? Uh, is the growth stable and retained? Am I retaining those customers or is it like superficial growth? And am I profitable, right? Do, do I have high margins for the customers I'm acquiring and retaining? And the thing you can do is what I usually try to do is tell people any product idea, even if your product idea is let's improve the user experience, has to connect to one of those three things at some point, right? Um, so you could tell a story that a better customer experience is going to drive growth a better customer experience is going to prevent churn, but a better customer experience is, allow you, is going to allow you to charge more for your service and product and improve margins, right? Um, so, and it could be all three of those. So step one is let's connect the story. And okay. to bring it back to product analytics, it is not just a decision-making and a velocity enabling tool. It is also a storytelling tool right? Data is a very powerful storytelling tool. And with a product like Amplitude, you, you don't just ask questions and get answers. There are a lot of capabilities that we have from dashboards, notebooks, uh, exec views, embeds that actually allow you to tell that story to people who don't spend all day in a product analytics tool, right? So there's definitely the storytelling. But to take it beyond something like Amplitude and just product analytics in general, storytelling is both quantitative and qualitative. So I find a lot of times if you have a data point, if you're like, look, I, can, I definitively know that all of our churn has come from people who weren't happy with the customer experience, then you go and get some qualitative storytelling. Go talk to those customers or those churned accounts and say, give me some quotes, give me some anecdotes on why, and then you can tell a qualitative plus quantitative story. And I found that definitely um, helps align people who historically have not uh, had a chance to do this. 
Two is I would just start really small. I would say, what is the highest ROI, lowest hanging thing that we can do that we all agree on? And let's try that. And if it lifts things, great. If not, we don't need to keep doubling down. I think sometimes where folks get into trouble is they say, hey, I think our UX is the reason why people aren't adopting. We're going to do a complete rewrite. We're going to do yeah. a complete visual refresh. And I think both from a lift cost perspective and time to value perspective, it's hard. So it, it's, you know, it's basic like uh, incremental approach to things is like do it in a way where you're starting with the MVP and can prove out value. The That's last thing I'll say, this is, yeah, I just want to say one more thing. It's neither qualitative nor quantitative. I think at some point it just comes down to principles. Um, so I'll give you an example. Something that I think is part of customer experience and user experience, but doesn't get talked a lot about is performance. If an app or a website is very unstable or very slow, um, I fundamentally believe people are not going to enjoy using it and may actually stop using it. Uh, but every company has to kind of make a decision and say, do we believe that to be true? Right. Um, and or do we believe that it matters in our industry, in our product vertical? Right. Because there's plenty of products where it's like people put up with timeouts and slowness. Right. Um, they don't have that expectation. But if in your particular line of work, it matters, then it matters. And so the data storytelling and the qualitative storytelling sometimes doesn't matter if it's like if we just believe this, if we believe we need to have the fastest app to win this market then let's go do that, right? And so sometimes it is a good exercise to lay out your product and design principles and say, are we living up to them or not, period. It's irrespective of what the data and the customers say. Well, thank you very much, Ifra. Appreciate sure. it. Thank you. Cool. We have another question from LB. LB, would you like to ask it live to Ibrahim? <clears throat> I'm going to read it then. Um, how would Amplitude and its features serve industrial software where user journey might be two years of sales uh, cycle before actually activation and usage begins? And mostly those software is expected to be on-prem and collecting user data might get red flags due to privacy regulation. Yeah, so a lot to unpack, excellent question. Let me try to tackle all of it. The first thing I would say is, um, I just wanna clear up any um, privacy and data collection confusion. Um, Amplitude does not collect user data. Amplitude actually collects events from your digital products. Uh, and we don't actually collect it, you send it to us, right? So you actually have some choice and intentionality in what you're sending us. And you're not sending us any user data or PII, and we actually have hooks and flags to uh, prevent things like that from happening. And we give you the tools to clean that up if it accidentally happens. The thing you're sending us is person clicks at the cart, then they click buy, right? Or person clicks search, then they click buy. And so then you can ask and answer questions and say, what is the most common things? What is the most common way things end up in the cart? Is it through the search bar or is it through the detail page? Is it through the listings page, right? Those kinds of questions. There's nothing about the specific user in there. There is just what was the modality, what was the time, things like that. There's a lot of metadata. And if you think about hundreds, thousands, millions, billions of those events, then you can start to look at them as scale and say, okay, the most common way people add to cart is the search bar, right? Things like that. So there's no user data being collected. The second is, from a um, data location governance privacy perspective, we have an entire govern offering that allows you to sort of manage and maintain the data in a way that is compliant for you. Two, we also support um, data hosting in the EU for anybody concerned about GDPR and things like that. So all of that as any sort of public enterprise software company should have, uh, we have that in place. To your question about, hey, there's a very long journey between purchase and activation. That's the great part about Amplitude is once the data is ingested, it doesn't matter if you ingested data about an event that happened two seconds ago or two years ago, it's available to the user to query and ask questions about, right? And we allow for very flexible, very uh, granular or very broad windows of look back to do that kind of analysis. So I've actually done this myself where I'm like looking at things, I'm looking at user behavior spanning two years ago. Right. So if, if if your window between you know conversion and activation is broad, that's not an issue, right? It just uh, it's just a date uh, range filter that you're applying. Um, and so I, I 
I think any digital product, whether it's industrial software, web-based, mobile-based, et cetera, uh, that's not the issue. I, I just want to answer the question about on-prem software. Again, how the software is written and deployed, whether it's mobile native, mobile web, on-prem, cloud, desktop software, doesn't matter because we offer the ability to do data collection in any modality, and it ends up in the cloud with amplitude to do the analysis, right? So how the software running is not the important part, capturing the behavior and the click stream and sending it to amplitude for analysis in the cloud is the important part. LB, I'm sure that uh, Ibrahim can uh, offer you more guidance. I think for sure it's maybe a challenge. It's not so uh, straightforward as uh, a digital product which doesn't have, which has a shorter uh, sales cycle. But um, I would say use the fact that we have the applicant team here, and I'm sure that they can um, help you figure out. Uh, how and the amplitude can help you with all these challenges. Cool. Um, we have another question from uh, Ndej. Uh, what is the best approach for product analytics for an out of the box product that wants to transition to uh, SaaS? Yeah, I, I love this question because it actually cuts to the heart of the differences in customer experience that we were talking about. Um, if you think about, I, I think what what Niji means by out of the box here is like shrink wrapped software, like you know the software you would walk into a software store and buy physically. Um, so what is the best approach? So first of all, let's assume your um, business strategy team has already decided we want to move to SaaS for a variety of reasons, right? Because there's a market there, there's money there, there's users there. Um, I'm I, obviously I believe in SaaS as a movement, uh, but I'm not saying every product makes sense as a SaaS product. So I think just answering that question is important, and that's a prerequisite to bring product analytics. But let's say now you're comparing, hey, I used to sell software in a box at a software store, and now I want to sell it online. Well, first is that the entire awareness and discovery journey is different, right? You actually might not have visibility into how people hear about your software when you're selling it physically in a store versus when you're selling it as SaaS, you know how they got to your website. Was it organic search traffic? Was it paid social media? Was it a campaign that you ran? Is it a referral from a partner? There's breadcrumbs, right? Uh, I'm not saying that can't be done in an offline retail world and Amplitude actually supports. If your physical retail partners support that, right? Um, I'll give you an example. I've been to my local Costco and I've seen TurboTax for sale. Um, you can still buy software physically, right? Some people do that uh, with CD-ROMs and whatnot. And so um, you can also get from your partners or your retailers, or it might be your own physical store, you can um, instrument that data and send it along and say, how did people buy it? What did they buy it for? What time of year did they buy it, et cetera? And then you can compare that to the digital purchase journey, right? Obviously, once the software is installed on a user's environment or in their browser, then the journey becomes similar, right? sign up, first time user experience, onboard, activate, start to use the product. Um, and then it goes on from there. I think in your, uh, in your SaaS world, the support and success touch points are all built into the product, right? How people ask for help, the questions they answer, it's all in product. In, in an old legacy software, it might be more, you know, you're going to a separate support site or you're calling a one inherent number. Again, th that data can be fed into a product analytics tool like Amplitude. And we have customers who do that, who say, let me overlay you know, support tickets and calls that I get in other tools with data that I'm getting from my own product. But to your question about what is the best approach, I would say you know, the reason to switch, what you're talking about here is distribution models and deployment models is I think it's gonna be better for my business, right? So I, you have to tie it back to growth is gonna be better, retention is gonna be better, and margins are gonna be better. Obviously, it's that, that's why a lot of products are SaaS products now is those things tend to be true. But to, the short answer to your question is I would baseline what it is now. I would try it out with a cohort of users who you know are receptive to this new model of delivery, purchase, and activation. And then I would compare. What I wouldn't do is get caught up in, um, it has to be as good as the old version because it's a completely new baseline, right? So the customer acquisition costs might be wildly different. The uh, you know rate of signups might be wildly different. The rate of active usage might be wildly different. Just to give you an example, 
somebody who walks into a software store and buys your software and then uses probably very high degree of intention, right? Uh, versus online where you might get a lot more users who don't plan to stick around. The flip side is, um, you know, the, the usage might actually be easier to nurture and activate on the website because you have more access to the user, you know more about them and you can personalize your behavior more accurately, right? Um, so obviously it was like, we could spend an hour on this. Uh, hopefully that gave you some ideas on how to start approaching this. But first question I would ask is, as a business, do we agree this is the right thing to do? Thank you. Uh, so uh, we shouldn't uh, mm, uh, uh, make these two approaches uh, into one, uh, our out of the box software and the SaaS one because they are different cohorts and uh, we should uh, approach them uh, differently after we are uh, sure that this business model will work for us. Isn't yes, I, th yes, that's correct. The one caveat I'll add is I, I don't know your business. It is possible that your SaaS user base is also your out of the box user base. Th there are products where they slowly are converting their users to the new model, but there are also products where it's like the, the box users are just different than the online users, right? And they're not, there's no overlap in that Venn diagram. You, I would, I would kind of generate a user list and a prospective user list and go interview some of them to figure out is, do you expect the growth, the buyers, the users to come from existing user or it's a completely new thing? The other thing to keep in mind is I assume like every company you have fixed number of resources. So everybody who's working on the SaaS product discovery activation onboarding is somebody who's not working on the old business, right? So one thing you have to figure out is how do I keep that business alive and growing while investing for the future? Because if people are like, this is not an investment area for this company anymore, they may start abandoning it, may give your competitors room, right? It's not like it's a $0 business. And so I do think one of the hardest things here to figure out is what I call a mixed shift, which is how do you shift from 100% on-prem to like cloud over time, right? Or 100% sold as shrink wrap software to sold online over time. Um, obviously many companies have gone through these kinds of shifts, right? Uh, video games are like that. Um, uh, uh, productivity software is like that. And you can see the trends in the market, but I think there's a lot of benchmarks you can apply and a lot of case studies you can learn from as well. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ibrahim. Um, I think we have time for one last question if anybody wants to ask anything. In the meantime, I would just like to tell everyone <coughs> that uh, we have our next product uh, management connect uh, in uh, July. We're going to send out an announcement. Uh, as I've mentioned in the beginning, there will be a recording provided to everybody who signed up for this so you can review again. In case you want to contact uh, Ibrahim for uh, other questions, uh, I would assume he is available on LinkedIn or Ibrahim. Yeah, um, I should have had a slide around this. So uh, first off, always happy to answer questions even outside of this um, session. So I just put in a short URL. If you go to that URL, uh, it will take you to my LinkedIn page. Happy to connect with everybody on LinkedIn and answer questions over LinkedIn. You can also find me on Twitter. I also have a newsletter. I also teach some classes. So um, just find me on LinkedIn. Happy to keep the conversation going if anybody wants to go deeper on customer experience, analytics, any of that. Great. Uh, so Valed, you asked me if there's a recording. So there will be, as I've mentioned, a recording for this. Uh, with that, I think, um, we're just gonna end close for today and wish everybody a good evening, morning, afternoon, whatever time is in your place. And thank again very, very much Ibrahim and Amplitude for uh, giving us uh, today their time and insights, which for sure, I think if you look through them, will be very useful uh, in improving your customer experience in product analytics. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Ibrahim. Everybody. Bye-bye. All right.